People love nostalgia. It's that unmistakable feeling that takes us back in time, evoking memories of simpler days. And for many of us, there's no better way to capture that nostalgia than with cameras of the past. Today, we're looking at the revival of a key part of photography history. We're going to explore the timeless appeal of film cameras and the charm of their slightly newer counterparts, retro digicams. Both of them have had a huge rise in popularity over recent years, captivating professional photographers and hobbyist hipsters alike. In the past, I've done a fair bit of experimenting with both full manual film cameras, like this Olympus camera right here, and I've also played around with point-and-shoot film cameras like this one. Whenever I'm traveling or just trying to capture memories with friends, uh, these two have been my reliable friends. However, prices keep increasing for film, and I've reached a point where I'm paying one pound per photo, which is simply too much. So when I saw a friend of mine pull out one of these, which are sort of vintage digital cameras that use SD cards or memory cards instead of film. I'm not gonna lie, I quickly fell in love with these because they scratched that nostalgic feeling that I was chasing without making me having to spend like two restaurant meals worth of money for every roll of film that I shoot. This brought up a question in my head. Are digicams replacing film cameras? In this video, we'll go over some key considerations to see if it's still worth getting a film camera in today's world or if digicams are the better choice for nostalgia enthusiasts just like ourselves. Okay, so for our first category for comparing film cameras and retro digicams, we've got image quality. This is quite a big topic, so I'm going to actually split it into three sort of smaller categories. First up, we've got sharpness slash bokeh, uh, bokeh being that background blur that you see with professional photos. Secondly, we've got the colors and the overall look of the photo. And the third subcategory is low light performance. So starting with sharpness slash bokeh, before we dive into it, it's important to note that there's two types of cameras within each film cameras and digicam. You know, first up, we've got the full manual film camera, which allows you to do full manual settings. Uh, you can you know, change everything that you want to. It looks something like this, usually a bit on the bigger and bulkier side. Secondly, you've got a more compact sort of point and shoot film camera. And this one, like the name implies, is just pointing and shooting. It does everything for you, everything's automatic. And this also applies for digicams. Now it's hard to group these together because there's so many different types of cameras. However, generally speaking, the full manual camera does give you excellent sharpness of images and that beautiful background blur that everyone's chasing because you have full control over the aperture and the shutter speed. This is not possible, on the other hand, with any point and shoot camera. You don't really have that same depth of field because you don't have the same control over the aperture. Now you might ask yourself, what about digital cameras? So we've got full manual and point and shoot for film cameras, and the same exists for digital cameras. So here is a old retro sort of digital point and shoot camera. However, the ones that actually allow you to do full manual settings are basically the modern day mirrorless or DSLR cameras, just like this one. And this falls outside of our nostalgic bubble that we're discussing today, so it is disqualified. Although it is interesting to think about at what point in the future these sort of DSLR cameras are actually considered vintage. So now that we've got an overview of the cameras, back to the original argument. In terms of image sharpness and the background blur, aka bokeh, the full manual film camera is the best one. It is the only one out of the three relevant camera types that is able to give you that you know, depth of field and blurry background. Okay, moving on to the second part of the image quality section, and that is the colors slash overall feel of the image. When I got my retro digicam of eBay, the first thing that I wanted to check is if it is possible to get that nice sort of filmy, grainy look that we know and love from film photography. I'm actually working on releasing my presets at the end of the year. So if that is something that you're interested in, make sure you sub to the channel and watch this space. In comparison, digicam photos are a bit boring when they first come out of the camera because there's no sort of organic color grading that is happening. However, you do get more flexibility because if you're importing the JPEGs into Lightroom, you know, you can slap multiple presets on the photo. That way you can experiment with different looks, which is not as possible with film photography. It's kind of hard to definitively say which one of these cameras has the better colors and overall feel. Film naturally gives you a nice color grade, whereas you have to do some work with digicams. On the other hand, digicams do give you that flexibility in editing because you can just apply different presets onto your image. So kind of hard to pick a winner here. I'm going to call it a tie for colors. Next up, we've got low light performance. Neither film nor digicams are particularly good in low light situations. However, you can kind of work around it by using long exposure photography. I never actually used my full manual film camera for long exposure photography because frankly, it just <laughs> seems like a lot of effort and I don't want to do it. You have to get one of these like wire release things so that you don't shake the camera as you press the shutter button. And I just never motivated myself to do that. 
I did, however, take up my Olympus Digicam, this one, out in London to take some night shots using the long exposure setting. And retro Digicams have two advantages when it comes to long exposure photography when you compare them to film photos. A, they have a self-timer option, which is great, so you don't need the wire release thing. And B, you can actually take as many photos as you want because you have a memory card, not a roll of film. And if you've ever done long exposure photography, you'll know that trial and error is a big part of it. Have a look at this photo that I took near Tower Bridge in London using the Olympus Retro Digicam. Honestly, when I looked at the photo, I was honestly shocked when I first saw the photo because I thought it rivaled some of the pictures that I've taken with my Sony APS-C camera, which is considerably more modern and higher spec than the Retro Digicam. There was also a surprising but welcome artifact. If you have a close look, you'll see these stars in the night sky and they just look awesome, right? They really spice up the image in my opinion. But then you realize they're not actually stars, they're dead pixels because if you zoom into the water, you can see the same stars weirdly swimming in the water. So in terms of low light performance, it's an easy win for the Digicam and the running score is one all. Before moving on to the ease of use and workflow aspects of both cameras, I'm just quickly gonna dish out some bonus points. So. The Digicam gets a bonus point for having video capabilities, which no film camera usually does. I was really excited to find out that these cameras actually have video capabilities because you can do these nostalgic sort of old collages with them. Now, despite how sharp and high quality their photos are, the video quality is kind of dog shit to be honest. Uh, it's really pixely, low frame rate. Some of them don't even have audio, like this camera doesn't have a microphone. However, I couldn't help but kind of loving it because you know, I was reviewing these clips that I got of Georgia when we went around uh, Germany earlier in the summer and instantly got this nostalgic feeling, even though those were clips from like last month. And yeah, I really appreciate having this cute little toy with me that can also film videos because I can use those videos for, you know, cool reels or sort of cute video montages in the future. The film camera team also gets a bonus point because there are vintage lenses that you can buy for very, very little money and you can actually use them on your modern day sort of digital camera equivalent if you buy a converter. When I first had a look at vintage lenses for the Olympus OM2, I was really shocked to see how cheap some of these lenses were. I literally bought a zoom lens for five pounds, which is ridiculously cheap. Then I actually had to buy a converter, which was not so cheap, it was like maybe 40 pounds. But as a result, I basically spent 45 pounds on a new telephoto lens that I used when walking around London. So moving on to the next category then, we've got the ease of use slash workflow. Now the way I like to use these secondary cameras is I want to be able to just chuck them in my pocket or my bag when I'm leaving the house and uh, not really have to think about it. I want it to be convenient and portable, which both point and shoot cameras certainly are. So these you know, point and shoot film and point and shoot digicams, super tiny, fit in most pockets, and you can even just give them to a friend and let them take a photo of you, which is great, and not really applicable for the full manual film camera. While they are both portable and very durable, there's a big difference when it comes to the actual workflow. Retro Digicams are very convenient because you can take as many photos as you want without having to worry about running out of film. Film cameras, on the other hand, you obviously have to load the film in, you have to get the film developed after you finish your roll of 36 shots, and that often depends on the availability of photo studios near where you live as well. Now, I live in London, so there's a lot of like photo studios like Snappy Snaps around. It's very easy to find a place, but that's not the case for everyone. And sometimes you might be a little screwed if you can't find a photo studio and you don't have the patience or the resources to learn how to develop film yourself. And some people might kind of like the aspect of film photography that you're not able to instantly check the photo. You have to wait a couple of weeks or months to get your film developed once you finish the roll and then you get to see it. I kind of get that feeling for sure. However, it is also really annoying sometimes because, you know, for example, you might have this amazing scene in front of you once in a lifetime shot. You get your film camera out, you take it, only to realize a couple of months later that you left your finger in what otherwise would have been, you know, potentially the best film photo you've ever taken. Not that it happened to me or anything. So the workflow for Digicams is simply easier than for film photography, which is why the team Digicam takes the point for this round. Okay, moving on to the last category of this comparison video, cost. Cost has always been a massive barrier to entry for a lot of beginner photographers hoping to get into this. And traditionally, film and sort of retro digicams were both seen as sort of cheaper alternatives to buying a professional camera to get started and find your feet in this photography world. And this was great, but everything changed when the film nation attacked. A quick look online and it quickly becomes apparent that the cost of shooting film has drastically increased in previous years. Partly due to loads of people getting into it over lockdown and rising costs of living around the world certainly haven't helped. You can still get a film camera under hundred pounds, 
But keep in mind that every roll of film will cost you about you know, 18 pounds, for example. Getting it developed at, for example, Snappy Snaps in London is another 18 pound, which works out at about a pound per photo, which honestly is way too expensive. Now I'm aware these numbers vary from place to place. You know, if you do some digging, you can find cheaper film, uh, or you can even find like an alternative photo studio that'll do it for cheaper. But that's not the point of this argument. It's supposed to be a generic point around cost, and simply said, it's very expensive to shoot film. For retro digicams, you can also easily find a camera under £100. You then get yourself a memory card, but the main difference to film photography is, once you've done that initial investment for digicams, you have to pay no additional money. You know, once you have that memory card, you basically have infinite photos for the rest of your life. So from a cost standpoint, it is another easy dub for the digicam team. All right, we covered a bunch of points today, but what does that actually mean in terms of the question that we're trying to answer? Are digicams replacing film cameras? In the end, for me personally, full manual film cameras cannot be replaced. So their photo quality, the, the charm of using it, the tactile feel when you use this camera is, is still irreplaceable in my opinion. I will also mention that shooting full manual film is a great way of learning the basics of photography. Because it doesn't do anything for you in terms of there's no you know, full automatic mode, you're kind of forced to learn the basics of photography, you know, including exposure, shutter speed, aperture, and so on. But on the point and shoot side of things, my Digicam will definitely replace my point and shoot film camera because you can still get the same kind of nostalgic feel and the retro vibe of the camera with considerably less faff and a lot less money that you have to spend on it. All right, thanks for coming to my TED talk. Let me know what you think in the comments below if you're part of you know, the team Digicam or team film going forward. I hope you enjoyed the video as always. I'll see you next time. <laughs>